Okay, so I guess now that uh, it's taking the ages, I should start. Um, please let me know, just type in the chat window or something, if you can't hear me or if anything I say is not clear. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is adding well, it's what I call hybridization, adding OpenMP, adding another parallelism to a code that's already parallelized for some reason. Um, and in this case, what we're adding is OpenMP to, M to an MPI code, a Fortran MPI code called GS2, which is a, a plasma simulation code. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not a plasma expert, so I can say these words here, but it doesn't necessarily I mean, know I mean what all of them mean. But uh, GS2 is a, is a gyrokinetic code, it's a flux tube gyrokinetic code, um, which solves gyrokinetic equations for perturbed distribution functions and uh, also for turbulent electri uh, electrical and electric and magnetic fields. From the from my perspective, the things that are important trying to work with this code is uh, 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 to know well it, it can do different things. It can do linear simulations. It can do linear plus nonlinear. It can do linear plus nonlinear and also include collisions between the different species of particles in it and, and further things. Um, and also what kind of data domain we have. So effectively the gyrokinetic equations have 5D data domain, three spatial and two velocity because one of the velocity um, dimensions is, is averaged in the gyrokinetic averaging. Um, but again, as I say, please, uh, there are, there are actually people on, on here I see um, who know much more about the, the gyrokinetic stuff than I do. Um, it was originally a US code, uh, but it's heavily used in the, in the US and the UK and worked on quite a lot in the UK. Um, in terms of what this code is actually doing, at a high level, of course, it's a very simplified. Um, it, has, it does two things. Firstly, it does some initialization, some setup, which you know all codes uh, do. Load some data and calculate some stuff at, at the beginning. The reason we care about this for GS2 is that actually that initialization can be quite costly. So, I mean, for a big simulation, it can be order of five or ten minutes. The initialization. Now, obviously, if you're doing then full simulations so of 12 or 24 hours or 48 hours, then this uh, initial 10 minute, 5 minute, whatever it is, setup is not, is not um, a big impact. But if you're doing optimization work and parallel performance and things, then we, we may only run for another 10 minutes after that. So the initialization can be quite costly in terms of the work we're doing. Um, and inside that initialization, it, it evaluates the distribution function a lot of times. So it calls some code a lot of times. It costly. And then it goes on to do the, the actual calculation, the actual simulation, and it has a loop over, effectively a time loop, a loop over steps, which you can set how many steps you want to run for. And then in that, in there, uh, it does evaluates the distribution function. It calculates, it then updates the fields based on that, and then it evaluates the distribution function again, and it iterates around that loop. And then inside the actual evaluation of a distribution function, it does a calculation of nonlinear terms if you wanted to do that, it does a calculation of linear terms, it does collisions, and it does, it does much more than that. But from our perspective, these are sort of the big costly, costly um, things. Now, I mentioned this up front, it's, it's a little bit um, mentioned maybe too early, but it's, it's important to understand how the, the code is structured when you come on to look at how you add different kinds of parallelization to it. It's also important to point out this code has been quite, the MPI code, the pure MPI code has been quite heavily worked on over the past few years to make it more efficient. Um, so this is, uh, don't worry what, what the different um, uh, lines particularly mean, but don't worry if it's more than two. Um, but this is uh, sort of an example of, of work that was done recently. Uh, we, we at EPCC have done optimization work on GS2, but also the guys at CCFE at Cullum um, and other places have done uh, significantly more work than we have, including David Dickinson, who's, who's now at York, who was at CCFE. He's did a lot of the 
NPI optimization work here. And we can see uh, this graph is just um, to show the runtime between an older version of the code, which is the blue line, the top we'll call the trunk line, and then the other lines below it, which are different optimizations on the NPI code. So we can see that there's already been a lot of work to make this code scale better. The original code, when we were going um, from 256 processes up to 8,192 processes, did not scale very well at all. The blue line is not flat, but it's not that close, not that far from being flat. And the work that's been done has, has, has both increased the, improved the scaling, so the, the other three lines are, are, are much, um, scale much better than the original code, but also has actually improved the initial runtime, so we can see that the, the, blue, the uh, red and the purple lines particularly start much lower down the blue. So this is the position we started this, this hybridization in, that a lot of work had already been done to make GS2 scale well. Um, it's now a much more efficient code than it was before, we can, and, and the scientists can run bigger simulations. But there is a point where that code, and I'll, I'll come on to show it, stops scaling. So although the code uh, runs well now, it does run out of steam at some point. So this is this is a graph of a reasonable simulation with full collisions, nonlinear and linear calculations in it. Uh, and this is the time of the MPI, of the initialization and the advanced time put together. But this is what it, it scales like for a reasonable size problem. Okay, so we can see that uh, this is this, the scale on the bottom of the graph is number of nodes on Archer, and there's 24 cores a node. So we start enough on the left at 256 cores and moving out to about 6,144 cores. Um, and we can see that it scales OK to begin with, but when we're getting out to a bigger number of cores, the performance is sort of is, is, is flatlining and not really going further. OK, and we can look this, we can break this down and compare the initialization time with the advanced time. And we can see actually that in this advanced time where it's doing most of the simulations, it scales a bit better than the the profile I showed you, showed you before. It, it, when it's just in the calculations, the simulation, it's scaling really quite well at the beginning, and um, but it's still tailing off towards the end. And if we look at the initialization, well, that, that doesn't, is not scaling particularly well. But we could ignore the initialization, given that it's generally only run once, and then the code runs for a long time after that. But the, the, the starting point for this work is that we want to try and make this scale further. So we can go up to large numbers of cores, but the scaling runs out, and we'd like to push that graph out further. So what we, what we did was have a look at the code in profilers to see what's going on there. And it may not be um, particularly easy to read this, but this is uh, actually not from Archie. This is from another machine, but this is profiling information using Scholastica. Um, and what we've looked at here is overall runtime for, for a given problem on 512 cores, and then we compare it to overall runtime on 2,048 cores. And if I I'll go back to a 512 core version, to start with, um, it's, it's not particularly easy to read, but on the top left we have um, just where the first, where this first. Um, highlighted line is, we have the total, the time spent in execution and the time spent in MPI. And we can see here that the MPI time for 512 cores for this run is something like half the calculation time. Okay, and then we can see where that's apportioned through the rest of the code, but we don't need to worry about that too much. If we then go on to 2048 cores, we can see that actually now the MPI time has now grown to be more costly than the actual simulation. Okay, so it takes longer to do the communications in 2048 than it does the calculations. And then we looked at similar things also on Archer using Cray pattern throws instead of Scholastica. Here we've got, this is a slightly more uh, involved, slightly more uh, uh, complicated run, but we've got 512 cores, and we can see for this, 47% of the time is being spent in MPI, and then, um, well, it says 
3.5% of the time in, in user, but actually if you add that uh, together with the etc code at the bottom, you've got about 55% of the time being spent in the user, uh, the code, the, the execution, and the packing and unpacking of data to be sent via MPI. But then if we go up to 1,024 cores, we can see that this is it has swapped over and now we're running at 65% in MPI and 35% in, in user code. And these are slightly different for the Scholastica data because actually the Scholastica data didn't have the collisions turned on and collisions is quite um, a communication intensive operation. So we can see when we've got the full science in here that the performance of this code is, get, is becoming heavily dominated by the MPI at scale. Um, I didn't add this in here, uh, which I should have done, but this is because the way that GS2 uh, works is it splits up its, its data domain across processes. So the more processes you use, the more you split up your data. And then when you do these different parts of the calculation, the collisions, the linear, the nonlinear, you have to move your data around because the, the actual calculations are done on, on, on data as it's, it's structured in different ways. So the more you split up your initial data across the MPI processes, the more costly it becomes to undertake your MPI communications. So we have a, an almost sort of exponential problem, but the more you, you're splitting up your work, so you're getting less work per process, and the communication load is going up as you push up the number of processes. So what we wanted to do is to be able to use a bigger number of processes, but without increasing the number of MPI tasks, the MPI um, processes. So we want to use a bigger number of calls without increasing the MPI processes that we use. And to, to do that, we want, we, we're going to add OpenMP to the code so that we can scale to a large number of calls but have a smaller number of MPI processes and then, then each MPI process kick off a number of OpenMP threads to make use of the extra calls we have. Okay, so um, is there any questions? Well, if there's any questions, just type them in the box as we go on. Um, that being the case, then what do you do to add OpenMP to an MPI code, what are the things that you nearly, you have to consider at a high level and the, and the modifications you need to make inside the code to do this? And you know, one of the first things you need to work out is where are you going to do your parallelization? At what level are you going to add your OpenMP? Okay, you are you going to add OpenMP at the subroutine level? add a parallel MP region to each subroutine that needs parallelized, okay, or are you going to add a, a parallel OpenMP region to the whole code, and the whole code is where an OpenMP threads. And these, there's different trade-offs here, so if you add a parallel region to each subroutine, that is, you control your OpenMP parallelism at a subroutine level, or, or at a loop level, or, or something like that. That's nice because you have direct control over each bit of parallelism you're doing. So you can say, well, this bit of a code, I want to do this kind of parallelism here, and another bit of a code, I want to do this kind of parallelism here, and I want to switch off the parallels in between them. So it, it makes the development of the code a little bit more simple because you're isolating the OpenMP parallel to small sections of the code. Okay. Um, and we don't have to worry about what's going on by routines, called by routines, and these kinds of things in, in general. Um, but there are problems there. Uh, adding OpenMP regions to every subroutine that you want to parallelize means you maybe have more overheads because each time you call an OpenMP parallel region, that might cost you something. It may have to set up the threads and, and destroy the threads at the end. It may not do that. It might keep them around, but there's still going to be some overhead for those opening and closing parallel regions. You also have to worry a bit about uh, despite what I just said, uh, about nesting of parallel regions. So if subroutines call other subroutines which call other subroutines, you can't really have, you can't have one parallel OpenMP region inside another. So you have to fully understand what's being called from where and probably put your parallel regions at the lowest level, at the, sub at the final call subroutine rather than at a higher level. Um, 
Um, and it also, this approach of, of, of putting small scale parallel regions in means it's quite easy not to parallelize all your code. So you've got an MPI code and you use an MPI to, to, to run across a number of cores, but you're not running MPI processing all those cores. You're leaving some core three, free to run open MP threads on. But if you've only put open MP into small bits of your code, then the time you're in bits of the code which don't have open MP, those spare cores are going to be sitting doing nothing. You're going to have a you're going to be wasting those cores. So you're going to lose some parallelism there. Right, so the alternative is you try and put the parallel region higher up in the code. You know, maybe at the full, uh, you know, just one parallel region for the whole code, or maybe at a slightly lower level. So this should hopefully reduce the overheads because you've got a small number of parallel regions. Um, and it also forces you to, to make all your code parallel with OpenMP if you can. Okay, so you don't have that risk, the same risk of leaving out bits of the code and then leaving cores um, idle. But then it makes it more complicated to write and control your OpenMP because you have a parallel region in, in one routine which may call many other routines and then you may have what are called orphan directives in those other routines. So these orphan directives are OpenMP directives which are not in the scope of a, not in the lexical scope of a parallel region, but inside a different function which is called from that parallel region, or inside a different file which is called from that parallel region. And that can complicate things. It also um, is sort of a flip side of forcing more code to be inside the OpenMP. It's forcing, it may force code into the OpenMP which can't be parallelized with the OpenMP and you have to do something about that. Because it's, whilst you'd like to parallelize all your code with OpenMP, in this hybrid code, it may not be possible to do some things with OpenMP. Um, yes, and, and also it doesn't give you the same control generally of how you um, set up your OpenMP variables. So in OpenMP, we have this concept of being able to define shared variables and private variables and, and, and some variations of those, and that's generally done. Um, for a lot of the stuff, particularly the shared stuff, at the parallel le region level. So when you define a parallel region, you can say what variables are shared and not, and private and not. You can also do that private stuff on the loop level, but you can't do the shared stuff at the loop level. So it restricts you a little bit in what variables you can use where in the rest of your code. Um, so there's that decision to be made. And then the other decision to be made one of the other decisions you made is, is how you support MPI communications within this hybrid code. So before you had a code which was just a pure MPI code, each process did its own MPI work, that was fine. Now you've got a code where each MPI process creates a set of threads. Where do you do the MPI communications? Okay. Now uh, the first thing you have to change is you have to change your MPI init from MPI init to MPI init thread. So there's a new function which MPI provides for you to use when you're trying to do a hybrid code. Changes MPI init into MPI init thread. And then at that point, you can ask for a particular kind of support from the MPI library. And MPI defines four kinds of, uh, four levels of multi-threading for its library uh, communications. Um, these, the, the listings on the slides that I've given you here, that's just pulled directly out of the MPI um, sort of man pages. Um, but what they're, they're MPI thread single, MPI thread funneled, MPI thread serialized, and MPI thread multiple. Now the first three of these, okay, um, the first three of these are single, only one thread at a time, any time we'll send a message. Okay, so you're only sending thread messages from, from effectively from one process, so a thread owned by one process. All the MPI, OpenMP threads can't send messages, but one, one can. And there's different levels of that. So if you're serialized, MPI thread serialized, any thread can send a message, but only one at a time. And if your MPI thread funneled, well, only the master thread, only thread zero can send um, messages. 
And then if you're MPI thread single, actually you're not doing open MP parallelization. You've only got one thread. So the process has created a thread that was only one of them. Okay, so we're not looking at that. Um, and you ask for, for what support you want when you call MPI init. So you say call MPI init thread and then you pass in, I want to do MPI thread serialize or MPI thread multiple. And then it passes you back a variable which says, well, yes, I can do that. Oh, no, I can't. Okay. So what are the pros and cons of doing this? Well, um, for funnels, we don't have to change, we don't really have to change the MPI code. Okay, we're just using the same MPI code and then what we're going to do is put a master region, an OpenMP master region about around any MPI call which is inside an OpenMP parallel region. Um, and we're going to have to put a barrier before and after that master um, to, um, to, to, let, to make it work correctly because the master regions in OpenMP uh, uh, do not have barriers on them. Um, so that's an easy one to implement because you're not you're effectively not really changing the uh, definition of a, the way the MPI code was created. You're just adding something on top of it. Serialized um, is quite similar to funneled, but it means you don't have to use this master region. You can use a single OpenMP single region, which means you're not having to wait the process. Uh, for thread zero to get there, the first thread that gets to the, the MPI communication can do it. Um, so both of those approaches um, are generally straightforward to do. You don't have to change the MPI code, but of course, um, you're not using more than one thing per process to send communication. So you may be leaving behind communication bandwidth because if you say running four MPI processes per node, um, and you, you've got, each of those has got a number of OpenMP threads, but only one of those OpenMP threads at a time is ever sending or receiving data, then you may not be able to achieve a full bandwidth of that node. And of course, if you're doing something like a master or single and you have to wait for the MPI communication to finish before the OpenMP threads can progress, well, they'll be sitting there doing nothing. So you'll be losing that parallelism again. The, the final um, one, the final option is, is MPI thread multiple, and this is all threads can, can do the work. So you're not leaving idle calls, you're getting everybody involved in the MPI communication, they're all sending their messages separately to each other, and you can send a message from, a, from um, threads in one process to threads in another process. So ideally, conceptually, this is a nicer uh, model, because you are introducing a parallelism at the NPI level again. Um, the problem with this, in, in, and this is anecdotal, this is my experience, is that in reality, any NPI library I've ever used, the, the threaded version of it, which does this multiple communication between threads, gives you poorer performance than the um, normal NPI library. Okay, so from what I've seen, and that may have changed recently, and that may be different on different machines, but from what I've seen, um, you, you reduce, you get a little performance impact, a quite a significant performance impact from using this threaded MPI version. Um, and it also means you may have to change some of your MPI code because you need, so MPI is an idea of processes sent into processes. If you want individual threads in one process to send to an individual thread in another process, you may either have to set up communicators for those particular threads or set up particular tags so that one thread can receive a message separate to another thread. And if you're doing collective communications, depending on how you do it, you may have to set up separate communicators for the threads to work on, or you may have to set up um, separate communicators. Uh, set, you may have to add in an OpenMP order directive to do the collectives in a particular order. Right, so it's not straightforward. If you're going to do a hybrid code on Archer, then um, when you run your code, you have to stick in this special variable called mpitch underscore max underscore thread underscore safety to tell the MPI library what kind of threading you want to do. Okay, otherwise, when you call the MPI init thread and ask for, say, funneled, it is not set this, it'll say, it might say, I'm not supporting funneled, I'm going to cancel your program. 
This, I believe, is all documented on the Archer, for, for Archer, on the Archer, in the Archer user guide, or, or best practice guide. Mm -hmm. the, user guide. the user guide. Okay. So, what did we choose to do in um, GS2? Well, we chose to do funnels communication model. The actual communications in GS2 are reasonably well isolated in into certain sections of a code which in between calculations. So it's quite easy for us to just put um, a master region around that, a barrier before and after, and do it that way. Okay, that's what we chose to do. And we also chose to implement the OpenMP at a reasonably high level in the in the in the code. So we're going to implement it at the evaluate distribution function level. I'm just going to flick back to that slide. Apologies, it doesn't look good on uh, here. But this was the structure that I showed you before for GS2, where we we have this sort of thing what I'm calling evaluate distribution function. It's actually called time advance in GS2. And we're going to put a parallel region in there. So we can see for this, that means that we're going to have a parallel region twice every time we go around the time loop. So the time loop goes around, it calls the distribution function twice. Each one of those is going to have a parallel region in it. But say the time loop is going to be 10,000 or 20,000 steps to run for uh, 12 hours. That's only 40,000 parallel regions across that 12 hours. Sounds a lot, but hopefully the overhead there is not, is, is not significant. And the actual amount of work to do inside the distribution function uh, evaluation is significant. So the actual overhead of the OpenMB region, we hope, is, is going to be negligible compared to that. But it also means that we can pick up this initialization work, because that's mainly doing this evaluation of distribution function, and we can get our OpenMP parallelism into there as well, because we're going to sit at that level. Of course, it means every time that distribution function is called in the initialization, there'll be a parallel region as well. But it lets us hybridize both parts of this code in, in one go. Now, it, it's, not the, it's not the perfect, it's not necessarily a perfect place to put the OpenMP. Ideally, you would put it at the uh, level above, at the, at the main program level, so you just have one parallel region for the whole code. And indeed, in the future, we may do that. But it actually means you have to parallelize with OpenMP or protect with OpenMP a lot more of a code than we're doing now. And we also have to tackle something we're not touching here, which is the fields, the, the updates of the, uh, of the fields. And so for this first set of work, we decided to comply to this level. Um, and but that means because we're doing it at the reasonably high level, um, we have often directives. And I'll come on, I'll come on to, to what that means uh, for actually doing it in the code. Um, so we are also, so that means we are, because we're not doing it at the highest level, we are excluding some code. But actually most of the code, which we saw in our profile to be expensive, and maybe I should go back to one of these profiles. I know it's not, it's not massive, massively easy to read here, but the collisions, the things that say collisions, the things that say uh, get source term and uh, get um, get, yeah, get source term and add nonlinear here. They're all the expensive things and they're quite high up the, the profile here. But some of the things that we won't necessarily be tackling are things like the, um, the get field equation one, um, the Ediffuse LE layout, and some of the transport things. So we are leaving some performance on the table, but that's, that's to re reduce the cost of doing this parallelization. Um, so then, we've made these decisions. How do we then go, go, go about actually adding this to the code? So the first thing we obviously have to do is add the OpenMP. And effectively, we have a, the time, the, the, what I call the evaluate distribution function, and this is all we add in here. Where it says main loop, the code under there is what we add into it. We add a parallel region at the top, saying shared, default shared. And we had an in-parallel region at the bottom of this subroutine. And the only other thing we had to actually change was in here, they were doing, right at the end of the subroutine, they were doing some array um, 
their asyntax works. So GU is GU is getting added some G underscore fix part to it. So we added a work share region in here to parallelize that. Of course, we could have also parallelized it by turning this into a do loop, manually turn it into a do loop, and, and, and put in an open MP do at this level. But it, it, it involved changing the code less to put the work share in here. And I believe, although I've not done a test of this, that the implementation of work share versus do in OpenMP is, is relatively comparable. We also made the decision, or I made the decision, to put preprocessing directives in here to be able to turn the OpenMP functionality on and off when you compile the code. Now, in reality, you don't need to do this because OpenMP is something which is turned on and off by the compiler anyway. Usually, what it does is um, if you're not using OpenMP functionality, it ignores these big things we've put in, these directives we've put in. And if you are using OpenMP functionality, it doesn't. However, there are some OpenMP routines you put in, like tell me the number of threads I'm using and things. You want to be able to turn off if you're not compiling with OpenMP uh, enabled because uh, that causes issues. And also, there are things like the Cray compiler automatically has OpenMP turned on by default, and you have to manually turn it off. So if I can have a variable in here which takes, which manually takes out my OpenMP functionality, I can get around some issues you may have with things like that. So that's what we have. But it's, it's strictly speaking, it's not, it's not, uh, not generally needed for these codes. Um, now, because we're using orphan directives, so we've got a parallel region in, in a subroutine. And then that calls number of other subroutines which have OpenMP things inside them as well. What we're relying on is that the, the OpenMP default behavior for when a variable is a shared or private. And in this context, most of what we care of is module or global variables, things that are defined in a module, in the head of a module, or global variables are shared by default. And anything which is defined inside a function or a subroutine is private. Okay, and that's going to do, hopefully for us, that's going to control how the OpenMP functionality can interact with those variables. That, uh, unfortunately, though, doesn't work for everything we want to do. So there's, there's a bit of code here, and I hope you can read it. There's, there's we've got a subroutine called integrate moments underscore C34. And by default in there, it's got an allocatable array called total small. And when it starts the routine, it allocates the array. And then it does a do loop and does some work on that array. And we want to parallelize with OpenMP that do loop. So I've put in the OpenMP parallelization. But by default, because that variable is defined inside the function of a subroutine, which is an orphan subroutine, it's sat inside a parallel region which is defined somewhere else, that variable there, that array, will be private. So this loop we're going to do won't do what we want it to do. We won't end up with um, one single array with the correct result in. We'll have as many arrays as the threads have, and each will have a partial result in. Now, you could do something about that. You could, you could do some kind of reduction into a, a separate array. But the approach that we've taken here is to move that definition to the module level. So instead of being defined, that they'll be defined inside a subroutine, it's now defined at a module level. And then that will be shared by default. So when we come into the routine, all we have to do now is make sure that only one thread allocates that, because we've got a single shared array. We only want one person allocating it, and likewise deallocating it at the end. So we just put a, a master region around it. So you could put a single region around it as well. And that is, by in large, the only code modification we have to make. Of course, that's a simple example. There are places elsewhere where it gets more complex. So the, the, the nastier bit at the bottom here is, what do you do when you have many subroutines in the same module which have local variables that have got the same name? If you move one of them up to the module level, um, it, it, it will be shared between all those subroutines, but you may not want that because they may have different sizes, they may have different definitions. So, so in the end, we ended up creating more variables than we had before because every time we created a uh, specific variable or array, you know, uh, 
we defined one for a subroutine, we had to create a separate one for each. So you can see the things I've highlighted in bold here. Inside a number of different subroutines, there was available, uh, well, an allocatable array called V0, Y0, and V1, Y1, and V2, Y2. And we had that um, four times in different routines. But you can actually see that um, CLLL underscore V0, Y0 is a single dimension complex array, whereas CDLL underscore V0, oh no, it's the same, isn't it? It is the same. We had instances, not, in, not, not shown here, we had instances here where the variables had the same names, but actually maybe one was complex and one was real, maybe one was two-dimensional, one was three-dimensional, one was four-dimensional. So we couldn't use, reuse the same uh, variable across the routines, so we just created separate ones for each one. So there's a little bit of code bloat here, a little bit of adding more than we need to, but this lets us have these shared variables inside subroutines which are shared to OpenMP. And that, so, so obviously I'm not showing you, we went through the code and added um, a large number of um, OpenMP um, do loops and places where we had master or single regions throughout the code, but it's not, it, they weren't uh, particularly any other code modifications that we had to make. And then, so how do you then use this code on Archer? Well, as I showed you before, you have to export these, this mpitch max thread safety variable, which we're using as funnels. And then this is an example here. We've got two, three different examples of, of me running this on 22 nodes. So that's what's 22 nodes. I, I'm using it as, as uh, is that 512? It's 528, I think, is it? 22 times 24. 528 cores um, uh, potentially there. Now, GS2. Uh, the number of cores you use is, is um, to get good performance is quite dependent on the distribute on the actual problem you're running. So this problem I'm running here likes to run on 128, 256, 1,024 cores, and that gives you the least most of, least amount of communication for those for those runs. So for the first example here, we're going to run you using 256 MPI processes, and each has two threads. Okay, and I control how those threads are placed, those processing threads are placed on the CPU, well, sorry, on the node, by saying I want to put 12 on each node, that's the minus capital N, 12, and then the minus capital S, 6, says of those 12, I want to put 6 on each physical processor, and then the minus D tells it how many threads each process you um, you run will, will create. And that actually effectively means that the first MPI process will be put on core zero, and then we'll leave one spare for the, the thread it'll create. So it's called the depth field. So it'll leave one spare, and then it'll put the second MPI process on, uh, on core uh, two, and then four, and then six. And then for extra measure, I've thrown in this minus SS at the end here. here. Now, um, for correctness of the code, I don't need this. What, what minus SS does it enforces strict memory segmentation, i.e. processes, sorry, cores on one processor can only access the memory which is physically connected to them. So for most nodes in Archer, this means um, 12 cores can access 32 gigabytes in a node, and the other 12 cores can access the other 32 gigabytes. It's just a way of stopping OpenMP um, accessing the memory inefficiently. Okay, now it can have problems. It can mean you can run out of memory and these kind of things. But it's a way of of, of reducing the the chance of OpenMP threads uh, accessing memory elsewhere in the node. Um, in reality, I don't think this would have been a problem. I could God could have got away without using that. And, and then the other two examples are just different ways. So the second example is, well, I'm, I'm going to reduce my uh, number of MPI processes by two again. So I'm going to use four threads per process. I'm just running 128 MPI processes, six MPI processes per node, three per processor. Um, 
and likewise you could do the same with three OpenMP threads. Although for GS2 this would not be a good example because 176 MPI processors doesn't nicely split up the MPI domain, so you would probably would not give good performance. So, how was this beneficial? Was this worthwhile? Worthwhile? And so we have now here a graph on Archer of the performance of this hybrid code versus the MPI code using different numbers of, uh, of OpenMP threads, um, and this first graph is just for the initialization work, so not the main computation, but the initialization. Now, the, the MPI time is the dark blue line which has uh, diamonds on it, okay? So that's the one we saw before. And then each of the other lines are just different um, runs of a hybrid code with different numbers of, uh, of MPI to OpenMP processor threads. And we can see that for low number of nodes, so it starts off at 11 nodes, so that's 256 MPI processes, then it goes up to 512, 1024, and it goes all the way up to 6144. We can see for low numbers of MPI processes, but the MPI, process, the MPI version is, much, is still better. It gives us better performance in the hybrid version than any of the hybrid versions. Okay, so we can see here that the hybrid code is slower than the MPI. Um, now we would probably expect this because we're adding a level of another level of parallelization, another level of overheads into the code, and the, the problem we're trying to tackle here is reducing the number of MPI processes. So you know the problem we get is when we go up to large numbers of MPI processes, we start to see MPI dominating for this low number of nodes it's likely that the MPI is not dominating here, so we're just adding in open MP overheads um, and we're not getting the benefit of reducing the MPI communication that much. But the, the nice thing about it is when you go above 512 cores or 22 nodes, suddenly we start to get to a point where the hybrid code is getting more efficient. So the hybrid code with two threads is clearly faster than the open MP code at 1,024 cores effectively, and continues to be so as you, as you scale out. Um, and then we can see that if we, if we go to a large number of cores and, and, and use three threads, then the same is true, and we can scale out further than the MPI, the MPI code, although it's worth noting that red line with the squares on it, it does start to play, it plateaus out a similar point to the MPI code, although it's faster, and actually gets worse as you, as you increase the number of cores beyond that. Um, and then we can see that for larger number of threads, like four threads and six threads, the green line with triangles or the purple line with crosses on it, they're actually significantly worse than the MPI code for a, a big range of the number of nodes we're using, and only get better than the MPI code once we go up to scale, once we're significantly reducing the number of MPI processes we're using. Okay. And the same is true, so that was the initialization cost, the same is, is true for the MPI time, no, sorry, for the, the normal advance time, the normal advance time. So we can see the hybrid code is worse for low core counts uh, uh, and for low core counts with high number of threads, but better once we start to scale into those MPI regions, MPI dominated regions. And that's what it looks like when you put the total runtime together for this case, initialization plus plus, a, plus a, uh, the advanced time. Um, yeah, so we can see that, you know, it's not earth shattering, it's not twice as fast, it's not four times as fast, but we, we're at points where 25, 30% faster using the hybrid code, which we know is less efficient at, at smaller core counts when we, when we go to larger core counts. So that was all Archer. We've done a similar thing on Blue Gene, just for a bit of variety. So the Blue Gene Q machine is quite well set up to do hybrid threading. It, thread in, it has 16 physical cores per process, but each can run four threads um, very efficiently. I should note that the Archer runtimes were not using hyper threading at all. I've not investigated it in the past. For the MPI code, it hasn't helped. We should play a bit for the open MP code, but I haven't done yet. Um, but, so this is slightly confusing graph. I do apologize, but um, we've got three different versions of the MPI code for the Blue Gene Q here. There's the the blue diamonds, which is 16 MPI processes per node, and the fixed number, the same number of nodes across. 
and then we've got the the red squares, which is the 32 MPI process per node, and the green triangles is 64 processes, MPI processes per node. And then we have the hybrid, which is various different kinds of uh, threads using the same number of nodes. Uh, and what we can see is actually the hybrid, the purple line, which is hybrid with four threads. So there we run in 16 MPI processes, like the blue line, but we're using these extra hardware threads to do some, some work rather than leaving them spare. And we can see that we get reasonable performance improvement there compared to the MPI codes. So uh, at the six, uh, 128, was it, no, it's at 96 and 128 number of nodes, it looks uh, a reasonable amount much faster than the MPI code. When we get out to uh, 256 nodes, it's a little bit faster than not massively so. And then the different uh, number of threads has a similar performance as we saw before on the Arch machine, as in for lower core counts it's not as good and for higher core counts it gets a little bit better. But it should be noted here that the hybrid with 16 threads, that's four MPI processes and 16 threads per node, um, is not very good. It's, it's sort of the same, slightly worse than the MPI code. But then we do not expect GS2 to be working well at the large number of threads because the amount of parallelism in the loops we're splitting up is probably not high enough to run up to 16 threads per MPI process. Um, slightly, well, it's not, not particularly related, but we also have played around with this hybrid code just to finish off on Xeon 5. Um, because at some level, the Xeon 5 would make, should make a good target for hybridization as well because it has, a bit like the blue gene, it has 60 physical cores and each can run four hardware threads. threads. So it should, uh, it should make it quite efficient. Um, and we can run the hybrid code on the blue gene, on the, on the Xeon Phi, um, works fine. Um, but if we, if we look at the performance I've listed here, if you look, Archer performance is about, for, for a given problem, right, for 16 MPI processes, it's three minutes and eight uh, seconds. If we run it on the processes that we, as the Phi's are attached to, because of course it actually doesn't have the Phi's in it, 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 they're a bit slower processes, so it takes four minutes, 64 seconds uh, on 16 MPI processes. And then if we put it onto the Xeon Phi, um, because it's got these 240 virtual cores, we try and run something like 176 or 235 MPI processes. We can see that they're just a pure MPI code is slower than the than two processes on the node. So it's sort of six six minutes, 77 seconds, well, not 77 seconds, 6.77 minutes, I should say. That, that, these, these are, uh, yeah, percentages. Um, it's, uh, it's slower than the, it's, it's about a factor of 50% slower than the hooks. And if, if we push it further and run across two Xeon files with a with a not very uh, nice interconnect while going across the PCI bus, it's significantly significantly slow because we've got to this point where we're using even more MPI processes to so push in a lot more data and we have a slower connection. Slightly less nice um, is that the, the hybrid code where we would hope it would give us better performance on the fire, the on fire because we're using less MPI processes is not giving us as good as just running the pure MPI code at the moment. So 120 MPI processes, two threads each, seven minutes, 7.07 .07 minutes, compared to 6.77 minutes was the best we got on the pure MPI code. So I don't, we don't really know quite what's going on there yet, but so there's a little bit more investigation. But I just thought uh, people might be interested because we had played around with it on the fly, what, what kind of performance we were, we were getting. I should stress, we haven't put a lot of work into optimizing on the fly yet. It's just the same code which runs on Arch, which we uh, ported across built and running. Um, so that's about all I wanted to say. I should say that, um, so I do the hybridization work uh, supported by Epsilon Plasma Physics HEC Consortium grant that uh, Colin Rilich is heavily involved in this work from CCFE and uh, David Dickinson and other people, but David particularly worked very hard on GS2 optimizations over the past and a lot of the MPI work. I mean, the GS2 code now goes like two or three times faster than it did a few years ago because of the MPI work he's done there, particularly um, putting in uh, reduced communicators for collective operations and that kind of stuff. 
So that, that was all I wanted to say. Was there any any questions? And Tillman, you're not allowed you're not allowed to ask where's the same regime. Yeah, Simon, um the question is MPIO, is it thread safe? That is a good question. I don't know. I, I, I genuinely don't know. I've not tried it. This code doesn't use MPIO, it uses HDF5 and NetCDF, but we just we don't do that stuff in the in the uh, parallel regions. Um, we can certainly I should I should ask the guys from Cray actually. Um, is NetCDF thread safe? I think there might be a version that is. I think there is a version that is, but we're not using that here. We just master out. We just don't do it inside the in the open MP parallel region. I would put it inside a master and just call it from from there. Um, I, I think the open MP sorry the NetCDF library can be called from threads. In that sense, it's thread uh, callable. Whether it can be called from multiple threads at the same time is a different. Is a different I don't know. So whatever whatever holds MPI. Yeah. Yeah. I have looked at the parallel regions performance with Create but I can't tell you what the load balance is off the top of my head my head, but I could circulate it after. I do have some Create Pat stuff sitting around um on Archer which which I could circulate. I mean, because we're using small numbers of threads, so we're using two or three usually. We hope that the low, you know, there's a significant, there's a, enough work in there that the actual inside the inside the open MP we should be all right. But I haven't, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head. And I have found at times create pack can be a little bit uh, difficult to use with the hybrid versions. That may be operator error rather than actual problems of create part. Okay, well I'll look out I'll look out the results and I can circulate in, sell into Lucio and anybody else who's interested. <laughs>